And thank you to the government of uh, the Basque Country. <laughs> and thank you to the government of the Basque Country and Tanika for the invitation to introduce the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics uh, with you today. Uh, I've come to you from Australia and that's got two issues attached to it. The first one is, I was on a plane for over 24 hours to get from Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, to this beautiful city. But to arrive here um, was certainly a delight, so the 24 hours was worth it. The second thing is that the Australian version of English doesn't quite have um, the rhythm and the romance of Spanish. So I do hope that you will forgive me as I do this presentation in Australian for you. Um, one of the things that uh, my role involves as the chair of the World Federation is trying to have a view about what's going on around the world, particularly around issues of workforce development, employment, primarily jobs. And of course, that's not just in, to, in the rich world, the advanced world, but it's also across the developing world as well. So what I'm wanting to try to do very quickly for you today is to take you through a little bit of a journey of perhaps what's going on um, around the world. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you through a sense of what those transitions are that's going on in the world at the moment. The notion that the sweep of automation is contested, particularly in terms of how it's going to impact on jobs uh, and wages. Um, how some countries are responding some solutions that are really have been demonstrated here even this morning, but uh, uh, in the Basque country in terms of how you approach innovation. Uh, and then I want to quickly round up by talking to you about the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics. And of course, to make sure that during the time that I'm speaking, you are going to get onto your phone, it's allowed, and put down the dates for next October to make sure you're here for the World Federation colleges. So by the time I get to this, I want you to have your phone and your calendar ready so you can book yourself in. Uh, this doesn't seem to be working, so if someone could flick it for me, thank you. Um, here's the sense of some things that are going on in the world. And it's a bit challenging for me to be able to say this coming from the deep south of the world in the southern hemisphere. Um, but what we do know is global trade is under threat. Um, from the China-US dispute, and there is a whole pile of concern about what will be the impact of um, a Brexit, not only on the Brits, of course, but also in terms of uh, trade between um, in, in the European community. One of the big things that's facing the world at the moment, particularly through um, advanced economies, is wages growth is low. And the basic principles of economics that keeps our economy going is uh, we earn more, we spend more, we innovate more, we consume more and it keeps the world going. But over the last 10 years, one of the things that's really faced the world has been wages have uh, been stagnant um, across large parts of the economy. Yet, employment in the advanced economy and particularly in OECD countries is, uh, is the highest it's been uh, on record. We have, though, this sense of growing inequality between capital and labour, which I'll talk about later on, and this wonderful thing called multi-factor productivity that economists use. It's that stuff that's in the black box that says uh, employment's growing, GDP is growing, what's causing that? And some of that's the thing that goes on inside the firm. What is it that is about leadership, uh, uh, ideas and workers that makes the firm more productive and innovative? Um, but most countries are acknowledging that multi-factor productivity is in decline. And if we could switch again, I'm obviously failing on... Hello. Ah, there we go. All right, thank you. Um, so these will be figures that no doubt many of you would have um, seen. Um, all these predictions that new technology will lead to, to job losses. The World Bank in 2016, and I've only just given a selection of these, you could uh, get many of these sorts of predictions from uh, uh, many research houses. Um, the World Bank's anticipating that advances in automation will threaten between sort of 45 and 57% 50 of all jobs in the United States. 
And in fact, the White House um, is assuming that potentially automation will affect 83% of jobs paying $20 or less. Who's that going to impact? That's going to impact those people who are already disenfranchised um, in the labour market. And referring to our uh, previous speaker on, uh, on AI, some AI researchers are saying that by 2024, AI will outperform humans in um, translating languages. By 2027, AI will outperform humans in driving trucks and in working in retail. So you can see that these sorts of changes are intending to come. Um, the other element is, though, that the risks vary depending upon the country, and some of that depends upon the nature of the production in particular countries. So what that does mean, actually, that the advanced economies are possibly under more risk than developing economies because of our reliance upon uh, automation and technology for many of the, the jobs uh, that we do. So you can see um, that you can see that sort of the IMF, or so, some commentators uh, suggest that potentially 44% of jobs could be lost or significantly adjusted based upon automation in the advanced, in advanced economies. But in emerging economies, you know, it's down to 13% in Mexico, 9% in India and 16% in China. So you can see the impact is going to be quite uh, distinct. But against this backdrop, across most OECD countries, and I do have to say this very carefully here um, in Spain, with Spain being an exception and Italy also being an exception, um, employment is at the highest rates ever. Um, so, for example, in 2018, the employment rate amongst the working, ages, working age um, is highest ever in Britain, Canada, Germany, Australia, and 22 other OECD countries. So you sort of sit back and say, well, sort of what's going on in the world if we're saying that automation is going to come and take our jobs, but we've got this high degree of um, employment. But why and how? Well, in fact, it's been 10 years since the global financial crisis, which hit most countries for a six. Um, what the sense is that most employers, in good news, are choosing labour at the moment uh, over capital because of uncertain financial times. The downside of that particular story is the reason they're doing that is it's easier to offload labour than it is to um, offload capital if you've made a major um, investment. But possibly the biggest impact has been there has been a major focus in policy terms by lots of governments um, on making it easy for people uh, to get into work and to stay into work. Um, so what you can see there is the minimum wage um, has increased from 44% uh, of full-time medium earnings uh, in 2000 and today is about 50%. These are in global terms, so these are quite substantial changes that have been occurring. Um, but there are also some broader trends as well. In the rich world, um, the percentage of uh, the working age um, is declining. So, for example, in the 1980s, 25% of, of the rich world's working age population was aged 15 to 24. It's now 17.5. So the young people, the working age population, the young working age population is growing up in other parts of the world. And that's an important message that we as a, um, a federation of colleges and polytechnics need to uh, work on. But the most remarkable um, story has been the growth or the rate of increase in the participation of, of women. Um, and you can see that from uh, that graph there. Um, and that has come about from decisions by governments, uh, primarily uh, rights to part-time work, um, parental leave and more generous childcare arrangements. The reason I mention these is to show that, in fact, policies of government can make a big difference. Um, and that means that we are not just to be able to sit back and say technology is going to overtake us. Governments and uh, providers like um, colleges and polytechnics can play a role to moderate what might be some of those downsides in that area. Um, what are some other um, things that have happened on the policy front? Um, all of us have increased our education rates. You can see there from 
22% uh, had high, some form of higher education degree in 2000, and it's now near 40%. That's a massive increase in the human capital um, of many countries around the world. Um, downside is, though, that there is a sense that uh, labour is labour organisations are finding it difficult to bargain on behalf of their workers, and that's some of the reason why uh, there's problems with with wages. Um, the other bit that's giving rise to more jobs, despite sometimes people saying the gig economy is just a very small part of most, um, uh, of most countries, and in fact that is true, in, in Australia our figures show that sort of the gig economy workforce is around about 1% to 2% uh, of the labour market in Australia. But nevertheless, we've all grown used to using some of those um, services that are now available. And the one that's here is... Um, I might have in the past, if the tap needed repairing at home, I might have tried to do it myself. Um, it's generally a lot easier now that I look up on the phone and uh, get somebody come in and do that sort of uh, work for me. And I suspect that's what's going on um, around the world that's feeding um, growth in jobs. They're jobs that we never would have expected to actually emerge, um, but they have, and this will well be the output of automation. We're probably not going to know or be able to predict what will be some of the jobs that will come out from the growth in automation and robots. Um, so this sort of then gives me a chance to talk about what have been some of the approaches around the world that some countries are taking, particularly around what we call their human capital or their workforce planning. Now, at this point, I do have to apologise because I've um, shamelessly gone to those countries that I know about. Um, so my apology for those that I have missed out, particularly um, uh, countries in Africa um, and the like. Um, uh, in UK, uh, we have um, one of the leaders from the Further Education uh, College system in the UK here. Last week... Um, the UK or the English government, the May government, uh, released a major report um, on tertiary education. And fundamental to that was a message that possibly too much money has been spent or directed towards um, higher education at, this, at the expense of vocational education. And the strong recommendation of that is we actually need to rebalance that investment because we have run out, we are not having the right amount of people who need to be able to come in uh, and drive a number of jobs that require vocational skills. Um, in the US, and I've just been there uh, last month, um, the uh, Governors Association, all the governors from the US, are pretty well one of their one or two top measures or concerns is around the nature of their workforce. When there's an unemployment rate of 3.2% or something rather like that, uh, one of the lowest unemployment rates in uh, the US history, they need labour. They don't just need any labour, they need um, skilled labour. And so there's a strong focus at the moment on um, the notion of apprenticeship um, and workforce training. And we have a presentation uh, later on today that no doubt can talk further about that uh, particular initiative. Canada has done some big work on looking at planning for uh, their skills future. One of the interesting things in Canada is the central government uh, does, have not, uh, does not have a formal role uh, in vocational education and tertiary education in Canada. Uh, they've been able to sit back and say, actually, we need to do some better planning and coordination on that. It's all in relation to we need a different set of skills to be able to make sure we've got different skills coming into our labour market. China, very interesting what's going on in China. Uh, they have a notion, uh, they have an initiative which they announced about one or two months ago called One Plus X. Their concern has been that many of their students are graduating with a university degree but don't quite have that industry uh, or, or vocational skills that are needed um, for, through so much of the Chinese economy. And so what they are planning by about 2025 to have 25 million people go through this one plus X, X program. 25 million people by 2025 is possibly only China that could ever uh, talk about those sorts of numbers in that way. What does the X mean? The X is essentially to be able to get industry-defined 
uh, skills and competencies uh, to add on top of your degree so that you can be uh, a productive worker as you go into a firm. Hong Kong, very strong on, on innovation. Um, and Australia, what are we doing down in the bottom part of the world? Um, we have just had a major review into our vocational education and training system. Um, again, we suffer a little bit from um, a situation where we've possibly invested too much money uh, in universities to, at the expense of vocational education uh, and training. Uh, so there has been a major review of our, our vocational education and training system uh, where there will be a stronger focus on we need to be able to plan better for making sure that we are delivering um, really skilled workers into the economy that can help continue to drive uh, the innovation and change. Um, this one though, so there's a lot of things that are going on and we've had a lot of conversation about the good news about the impact of um, automation and the like. This one's a tad sobering and um, I read it a bit, a couple of times in fact on my 24 hours on the the plane, uh, which was quite interesting. So this is the Inter International Monetary Fund, of course, using macroeconomic modelling, sort of general equilibrium modelling, to be able to show what do they think would be the trend around the world based upon uh, the impact of um, robotisation, etc. Now, what they've done is they have said, OK, because normally in general sort of... Um, I'm no economist, so I'm, this is going to be a bit of an amateur hour here to tell you about what a general, equili general equilibrium uh, economic modelling um, system. So, but generally what they do is they try to figure out what will be the trend between people, inve or, uh, people or companies investing in capital versus investing in labour, investing um, in jobs. Um, but what they've done is they've said, OK, we're going to create a new form of capital called robot capital, and then let's assess what will be the impact if um, companies decide to invest in robots in place of people, is essentially how they've tried, um, tried to do it. Now, admittedly, this is an IMF staff um, uh, publication. As the IMF deliberately says, this is to stimulate uh, dialogue. Um, and I assume as it gets more and more out, there will be some interesting um, comments there. What the chart on the left shows, and this, there's a lot more data on this one, what the chart on the left shows, they try to do an analysis of what's going to happen to those people that are high-skilled versus low-skilled. Um, and what you can see there is um, wages for low-skilled workers declines over time, whilst high-skilled wages um, grow. Um, I don't know about for you, but for me that's a complete challenge uh, for me in the role that I have back in Australia, but also in the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics. We can't afford to let that happen. We've got to be able to use vocational education, skills training to be able to um, make sure that current low-skilled workers have the skills to participate in the um, uh, in really the, the uh, IT revolution or the automation revolution that's coming our way. The one on the right um, then talks a little bit about, that does a different sort of calculation which sort of says the impact will also be felt on those that are high, um, high skilled. Um, now this is what we don't really know but it's quite sobering to see these are some of the analysis that, it, that's, that they've done. What are some solutions that have um, been proffered? And I'm going to run through these very quickly. But they show very strongly um, the impact of skilling um, or investing in low skill and bringing up the skills of um, low skilled workers and middle skilled um, workers. And you can see then that the, um, uh, the, the income effect uh, on those wage groups uh, is quite important. So that's a call out to all of us, uh, to all members of the World Federation um, and all governments, that there is a priority across the world that we invest um, in training and building the human capital of those people who are at risk of being left behind. Um, what are some other uh, solutions? And to a certain extent, I feel 
having listened to some of the, uh, presentation, the presentations earlier on today, that in fact I'm preaching to the converted. But one thing that all countries are doing is saying uh, we need innovation right across the economy. I don't know about you, but sometimes when we hear the word innovation and sometimes when my government officials back home hear innovation, they think university, they think high-level research um, and development, um, and they think that's the only bit of innovation. But the real truth of the matter is that innovation is occurring uh, at that radical level, the classic R&D that we think about when we think about uh, research at a university level. But there is also incremental and process innovation. And this is where the important role of vocational education trained people come into play. They are skilled, knowledgeable workers who, given the chance, can come through and help a firm uh, improve its productivity and its innovation. The story that we've heard about this morning about the role um, that the technical colleges here play is a classic example um, in that way. And let me tell you, if you think about the, the spread of companies, there may well be that number of uh, big companies that can afford to innovate, but if we can agitate all of the small and medium enterprises in any country around the world, that's where the bulk of productivity effort can, um, can come from. So technical colleges, vocational colleges, can play a very important role um, in this innovation space. Um, and very simple here, the OECD gives us um, some guidance here through their Oslo manual for measuring innovation, which makes the same point. Um, they actually uh, propose and want to measure and are continuing to measure that innovation comes from within the firm, um, not just from new ideas, but applying and transferring new technology to existing processes, to existing production processes. But it's even around how the firm is organised. It's even around um, marketing and the like. To me, this is again where vocationally trained people are so uh, vital to be able to help come into a firm um, and do innovation in that particular way. But again, I feel like I'm preaching to the converted here, particularly um, having seen the, uh, uh, the exciting thing that's going on in San Sebastian here. The other important thing that we need to think through is innovation is not just some fancy add-on. Um, innovation or the process of innovation, which is certainly not linear, you go round and round, in and out, you're certainly not going to know, I'm going to start here, I'm going to get there and it's going to take me three steps. No, not at all. Um, it can be full of frustration. Um, I was really fascinated in the presentation about it needs, it needs, heart, it needs heart, and, uh, heart and mind and determination to be able to get there. Um, and so giving our students that chance to have that experience um, by being part of an applied learning process or seeing how innovation or technology is transferred uh, in firms should just be part of our educational offer uh, to students. Um, and so it's critical that that's what all colleges uh, should be offering uh, around the world. Um, and the last one of this is what that we need global competencies. I said earlier on that part of the difficulty of coming from Australia was 24 hours on a plane. Uh, the Australian version of English doesn't quite rhyme and uh, match the, uh, the beauty of, uh, of, of the, the Spanish language. However, we all understand and we all um, feel that there are the same issues that are facing vocational education and professional education um, around the world. And so we need to start thinking about how we prepare people to work in a global world. That doesn't mean those people are mobile. That means they understand what are practices that are going on globally so that they can participate um, in global um, supply chains. So many people from all around the globe will participate and trade in global supply chains. Right, I've got one minute to go. Um, and what I want to do is talk to you very quickly about the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics. We're a loose coalition of associations of uh, professional and technical education 
associations primarily. So my organisation, which is called TAFE Directors Australia, um, is a representative of all the TAFEs in Australia. Um, we have uh, the Association of Community Colleges in America, uh, Tanika here, uh, uh, the representative from China uh, and the like. We then have individual members, we then also have individual institutional members. Our mission is to be able to share our experiences, to be able to learn from each other so that we can all grow and um, improve. Uh, we were lucky enough last October in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Now I feel for everybody who travelled down to Melbourne to that conference last, that Congress last October. You can see on the bottom right hand corner, the Congress is clearly over because um, that's the organising committee saying um, uh, we're done. But um, uh, in in more ways uh, in more ways than one. But what we found out of that uh, Congress in Melbourne were the common things that we, we shared, how we can learn from each other, and how we can all value um, and learn from exchanges that we have. And so that does bring me to, with a high degree of excitement, to think about that the Congress in 2020, remember, make sure you get your, um, your phones out, because I want you here from between October 14, 15 and 16, to learn about the best from the Basque Country, to learn about the best about what Europe is doing in, in the skills area, and also learn about the best about what's going on um, in the UK, whether they're still part of the union or whether they're not. David Hughes, if you're around here somewhere. Nevertheless, um, come to San Sebastian next October. What is the theme? The theme is driving excellence in vocational and professional and technical um, education because it's going to be excellence that's going to give opportunity for people to, um, uh, to participate more strongly um, in the economy and help all of our economies grow. And so I really do look forward to being in this same venue next October uh, to be talking to you again in the context of the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics. And on that note, I say thanks very much.